For six weeks every spring, the center of the design world is New York City. My name is Daniela Ohad and I'm in New York speaking to architects, designers and writers who dominate this season. What are the difference between good design, great design and the very best? Best design opens new horizons, but more important, it enhances our relationships with other people and with ourselves. Patrick Parrish has been in the business of collectible modern design from its very start 30 years ago. He had seen it all, the flea markets, the auctions, the galleries, the blogs, and now he has summarized all of this immense experience in the book, The Hunt, Navigating the World of Art and Design. Patrick. Hello. Can anyone become a collector? I think so. I think it, you have to be, you have to educate yourself and you may be lucky that you have an eye so you, you won't need as much education. But if say you don't, I still think there's hope for you and it's by going to shows and museums and especially, especially buying books that, of the things that interest you. You need to study and learn as much as you can and go to every Milk Crate convention and go to every Picasso ceramics auction and you can become an expert in it. I totally agree with you. I so believe in education. That's what I do. That's why I do what I do. Also, even if you don't have the taste, even if you were not born with the taste, mm -hmm. um, living with great design has so many advantages. Yes. What do you think is the most valuable aspect of living this way? Well, I mean, great design, there's, I, I kind of veer towards great design that is beautiful, and there's other people that live with ugly design or things that people think are ugly. There's kind of a moment now with ugly design, but for me, it's things that are beautiful, like are calming, and, but even something that was ugly, if you really like it, that could be calming too. So I think just like a sunset calms you down, I think a great looking chair, at the end of the day, you sit in it, you feel comfortable, you feel great, it looks great, you look great in it, and I think that can really change your life. And it also makes your life more interesting. I think so, and I mean, you know, worst case scenario, you have something to talk about when people come over, when they go, what is that ugly chair? And you're like, <laughs> it's great. Oh, beautiful yeah. chair. I want to become a collector. Okay. I have $5,000, okay. I come to you, how would you advise me? I would say, I would want you to say, what are you interested in? And, and once you told me what you were interested in. I'm interested in, in furniture. You're interested in furniture, okay. $5,000 is not gonna get you a lot in certain areas. Let's say French design, it's not gonna get you a lot. But in American design, actually, at this point, things are kinda down, you can get great, you could get a great, great, Proto, you know, pre-production Eames LCW for five thousand oh, dollars. Something that I think in twenty years should be worth twenty thousand dollars. It's just not it's, in fashion right now. And it's a museum quality piece. Absolutely. So I can get a museum quality piece yes, for you can. five thousand dollars. Absolutely. It may take a little bit of looking, and you know, the other person that has the five thousand. But yeah, I mean, the last, the last beautiful, beautiful LCW I bought was about forty-five hundred dollars. Thanks, that's an amazing, valuable advice. So there is one section in your book mm -hmm. that I totally loved. It's the stories behind the scenes. Okay. And there's one story about the bracelet. Yes. Can you tell it? Yeah, I was at a peer show years ago, I mean like 20 years ago, and I, my girlfriend at the time liked jewelry and I would find her jewelry. And so I saw these really interesting little constructions, but th they were in a jewelry case with other bracelets. So I assumed, bad thing to do, that they were bracelets. So I took them out and I looked at them and I thought they were so cool because they were riveted geometric aluminum pieces. And I was like, these are really cool just on their own, but they're obviously bracelets because they're in with a tray of bracelets. Asked the woman about it. She didn't know anything about it. She bought it in the house on the Upper East Side. I took it over to my girlfriend who was working in the booth. I said, what do you think of these bracelets? She goes, oh, they're great. And she couldn't, she had a little wrist too, and she couldn't get them on her wrist. She goes, well, I can't get it on my wrist. I'm like, what am I gonna do with these bracelets? So I take them back. Flash forward, maybe 10 years later, I'm going into MoMA, and I see, I go into a show for uh, Elijah Clark, and I see the exact same aluminum constructions. They're they were little 
construct, you know, they were sculptures. They weren't sculptures. bracelets. Yes, these movable kinetic sculptures. And I just, I kind of, I, I started to laugh actually. I wasn't, I don't get upset like that. I should since they literally would be worth a couple hundred thousand each. Candles have long history dating back to ancient Egypt. But to this day, they evoke memory, spirit, and emotion. David Gill Gallery is hosting Michelle Ocadono's solo show, Bringing the Fire. It consists of sculptures of bronze festooned with candles. Michelle, thanks for being here. My pleasure. This installation is a result of a long journey for you. Tell me about it. I've always loved fire, and growing up in Miami Beach in the late 40s, early 50s, I was so aware of the Everglades, which burned periodically in the dry season from lightning. Nobody explained that was a natural process. I just used to stand outside my house in Miami Beach and see the gray, clouds come from the uh, southwest and smell the smoke and wonder what was happening. So something mysterious? Emotional and mysterious and possibly coming our way. There was a small sense of terror in the unknown. And not like tragic or frightening? No, but Nobody says there's fire in the Everglades as if they're saying, let's go swimming at the beach. To me, fire has a sense of nostalgia. And um, I don't know why, but I wonder whether we can read any of your biography through this exhibition. And you were talking about you know, mm -hmm. growing up in Miami, but what about now? No, I think that I'm bringing back the fire because I realize that we have air, earth, water. Fire is one of the four elements, and we've banished it, so we're missing something. So not only do I love fire and like to wa lose myself by watching it, I want to smell it, I want it to be around. I don't want us to move into the 22nd century with no sense of what fire is. I think you dress the fire in this exhibition with glamour. Well, it's very yes. glamorous. But I also wonder whether the story, the biblical story of Moses and the burning bush mm -hmm. has anything to do with your inspiration. Of course it does, but I think the real impetus for uh, convincing David Gill to go ahead with an exhibition that burned, everything burned, was a book I have by the Smithsonian, 1926, that says, Fire as an Agent of Human Culture. And what the book said is so remarkable. We used to think that what separated us from other species was tool making. No, then we saw crows take a straw and go into the anthill, and we saw chimpanzees mimic other tool-making behavior. Okay, so then we said language separates us. No, then we realized dolphins, whales, now even birds have distinct meaning. Guess what separates us from the other species? Our ability to take the spark and to maintain it. So this little spark and this thing called fire, fire as an agent of human culture. Wabjan Gavens was a tastemaker and designer who during the post-war years wrote articles and books about lifestyle and also designed furniture for the Widdicombe Furniture Company. I'm here with interior designer Amy Lau to discuss his iconic Mesa table, which has recently sold by Rego Auctions. Amy, Wabjan Gibbons designed so many pieces of furniture for Wendycombe, but the Mesa table 
is a particular success in the marketplace. What makes this table so great? Indeed, it's such a special piece. It's really a work of art and design. It's so unusual because it's very low to the ground. It's three levels of shapes that are asymmetrical and biomorphic. It's very unusual with its coloring and it was inspired by an aerial views of the Mesa lands in New Mexico and is a true pioneer of organic American design. And you have placed the Mesa table in your couture fabulous interiors. What's the power of this table to transform spaces? The power of this table, when I used it for Chicago residents, I put it right smack in the center. And because of its organic shape and the three layers and its lowness to the ground, it's amazing the tablescapes that you can create on it. Rob John Gibbons was British, a foreigner, who was living in America, trying to teach Americans how to live. Mm -hmm. Modern. And he never really entered the circle of the star designers that we see, like Charles Eames, Ira Saarinen. What was his work? How did his work stand out in the age of Mad Men? You know, I think the interesting thing about Robeson Gibbings, in the beginning, nobody really knew about him. In the 1930s, he would go to the British Museum and he would take from um, clay vases and, and bronzes and copy. He was the first one to actually copy the Greek furniture and then he would recreate it one of a kind. It wasn't until his work in Whittingcombe when he signed I think on in around 1946 that his work started to become more American. So I think that his work with Whittingcombe was really his first imitation to the American public. And the American public loved it. In 1952, he was on the cover of House Beautiful. So he really did receive a lot of attention. He's just not as well known as some of the others. What I find really interesting is that in his articles, he voices against biomorphic design three years before he came out with a Mesa table, which I consider the best piece of biomorphic design throughout this whole period. Mm -hmm. And he said it wasn't timeless and it was trendy. Then he came out with this piece. Do you know, what do you think was his inspiration um, aside from the landscape that you described? I think it was the first time he had to work for a company. Before he was doing things, I mean, he worked for some very wealthy people and just did his interiors and was only focused on doing one of a kind work. Now, working with Whittingcomb, such an influential company that we know later on Nakashima went to go work with Whittingcomb, he had to look at what were the influences, what was going on, what were the trends, and things that were truly American like the ranch houses, like the open landscapes, like the mesas, like the west. He had to look at those and he had to look at this more relaxed lifestyle and he had to create furniture that was easy and digestible for American consumption. The term rental furniture was coined in the 80s by American designer Dan Friedman. He wanted to describe furniture and design by designers that sought to express political, social, and artistic agendas. Felix Borrector, editor of Pinup Magazine, analyzes the revival of mental furniture in the new edition of Pinup Magazine. Felix, what is mental furniture? Mental furniture, as, as you just mentioned, is, uh, was, is a term by Dan Friedman, the designer. And by calling his work mental furniture, it was very much his way of saying that these are not inspired by the modernist canon and they're not inspired by historical examples, but they're a direct result of his subconscious, in a way. So. Um, he really used it as, as a way to describe his, his own work. What I argue in, in Pinup and with the story Mental Furniture, which is an homage to Dan Friedman, designers and artists are 
looking to, towards furniture to express the, themselves and almost use furniture as a tool, to the, a tool of expression. And, and I really love the way that you have identified this sort of movement. But I want to ask you, in the 80s, this was really the mood of the 80s. How, this mental, how did mental furniture produced in New York um, was different than, let's say, the postmodernist furniture that the Tor Sotsas and his friends created in Italy? In a way, that work is a lot more unabashedly personal. Um, I don't think, for the most part, Dan Friedman ever thought about mass production, whereas Memphis, they did have the ambition to produce their work Absolutely, in yes. mass. That's, yeah, you that's know. a great point. And I was reading your article. Um, this furniture tends to be challenging, both aesthetically and conceptually. And functionally sometimes. And functionally, <laughs> right. So is this furniture sold as sculptures, like fine art sculptures? Or is this furniture sold as functional objects? Well, I, that's actually a really interesting question because um, there is, there's actually no exact answer to, to that question. You know, they, as you, you know, we've identified 25 pieces by 25 different designers and artists and each one operates in a very different um, uh, circuit. Uh, you know, some are fine artists that are represented by galleries and their work is sold as sculpture in additions or as unique pieces. Some others are, um, you know, are pieces of industrial... Uh, industrial. Give me an example. Um, for example, uh, if you look at the um, a sculpture uh, called Butch Bench by the Swedish artist uh, Kasia von Zeipel, um, that is uh, a sculpture. You can sit on it, but it's a sculpture. Masterpieces can mean a lot of different things. In the new exhibition at Megan Edge Gallery, it means fine furniture created in mid century France by Jean Prouvé, Pierre Jeanneret, Charlotte Perriand, and Pierre Zachary. Hugh Megan is the mind behind this creative and absolutely beautiful exhibition. Hugh, thanks for hosting the first season of Spring Dialogues. Well, thank you for being here. There is certain magic attached to these aesthetics, which are refined, minimalist, somewhat uh, industrial, mm -hmm. that has come to inspire and feed the very, very highbrow taste of the 21st century. What is it about these aesthetics that has come to capture the love of so many art collectors and people who really understand design? Well, I, I believe that um, it has to do with the way those pieces were conceived, and they were conceived in the most uh, minimal ways. When you see uh, some of the pieces in the exhibition, you will notice that there is such a refinement in less is more. And I think that ultimately everybody that comes in contact with this aesthetic, which is post-war, as we, we're talking about, is very much seduced by this conversation. Yeah. And, and I feel that if you have it inside you, it's very easy to fall in love with it. Correct, yeah, and I feel that is a very good example of what masterpieces of French design uh, stands for. Wherever you install them, you know, if you, if you pair them with other uh, furniture, there's something that's just so perfect. This material is becoming more and more rare, and I hear this from dealers, that it's becoming more and more difficult to find it. And you have just commented that it took you three years. How do you, can you give me an idea of what it takes to source and to identify this material? Sure. You will realize that it is, it, they don't come by accident. 
you know, you have to search, you have to quest, and you have to understand what you're looking for. You have to know um, potentially where they could be placed. So it's really like a detective work, you know, that allows you to, uh, yes. to perform this kind of search. And, and who, who is the typical collector? Give me the profile sure. of the collector of this material. Um, often it's people that uh, collect contemporary art. Absolutely. I think yeah. that there's a synergy and suddenly you understand that the room as a whole has been totally uh, lifted. You and, know. and also there is a certain statement that you can make using furniture and art. Correct. But I want to tell you before I'm saying goodbye to you, I want to ask you a question. This piece mm -hmm. we see in my show every episode. What is it? Well, um, this piece is, is uh, very dear to me. It's, uh, it's a bibliothèque by uh, Pierre Chapeau. Um, there's few of those. I think that what's incredible about this bibliothèque is the fact that this man actually didn't decide to uh, challenge the obvious way of, of hanging uh, shelves onto a bibliotheque, as you can see it, they are actually held from the bottom. So therefore, they, ha they, ha they, are, they are somewhat s suspended. Thanks again. Thank you. For showing us around. I'm Daniela Omhad. Thanks for tuning in. And until next time, remember, feed your taste. This episode is supported by Rego, a worldwide leader in the sale of fine design at auction.